All right, thank you so much, robot person. So first off, I wanna welcome you to Virtual Coffee Lunch and Learn Edition. Uh, we have today with us Meg Gutshaw. I, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, and we are going to be learning all about string theory. Just a reminder, Virtual Coffee's mission is to create a welcoming tech community that allows room for growth and mentorship at all levels, to create meaningful opportunities for learning, like this one, leadership and contribution for everyone. To find our code of conduct, events, learn more, check out our website at virtualcoffee.io. Also check out the new shop if you hadn't seen that yet, FYI. So I love the fact that we get to do lunch and learns, um, especially, you know, ones that we might not have originally thought of. So string theory for one, um, definitely out of the realm of you know, the other topics that we've, we've learned, but all relevant. So before we get into our topic, I want to take a moment and uh, introduce Meg. If you haven't met Meg, Meg's an awesome person. Uh, Meg is a Ruby on Rails developer with a passion for open source and tech for good. She's always smiling, continuously learning, and quick to strike up a conversation. She takes her advice with a grain of salt and a shot of tequila. Without further ado, Meg, all yours. Hi, everyone. Um, Sarah, thanks for the intro. That was lovely. I just came up with it like five minutes ago. I'm like, hmm, I'm just going to read off my Twitter bio and see what I got there. Um, I was running around the house this morning collecting knit goods in their on the table here. And I'm standing up for this presentation because I have a feeling I may have to be wrangling my cat hip at some point between all the strings going around. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. So I use Canva and I'm going to present this. All right, can you all see this like big old Canva thing? Yes. Um, Right, it's awesome. Um, I'm just moving stuff around so I can see your chat and all that. Canva's pretty cool if you haven't tried it for presenting. It's like, I don't know, different than I thought it would be. All right, string theory with me. Um, we're not talking any sort of crazy physics or anything today. We're talking about knitting and crocheting. Oh my God, told ya. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Hey everyone, bitches don't knit. Um, why do I say that? So I'm gonna start off by telling you how I got into knitting in the first place. Um, I was it at Temple. And if you live in the Northeast, you know that um, city life in Northeastern US, people aren't the most friendly. Um, it's just a cultural thing. And uh, when I was at Temple and I lived on campus, I kept making friends with groups of people. And then just it fizzled out for some reason or another. I was like, okay, um, I'm not, I'm not sure what's happening, what's going on here, and it happened like three different times. And I remember being on the phone with my mom, like, what, what's the matter? Like, it must be me. This is the common thing in all these situations. And my mom was like, no, it's not. You're a lovely person. You're amazing. It's not. I was looking at clubs, and there's a knitting club at Temple. Why don't you join knitting club? Bitches don't knit. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll I'll try. So I went to um, Michael's and I got some knitting needles and yarn and taught myself to knit. 
and I went to knitting club and oh my gosh, she was right. They were the nicest people there. There was, um, there was a whole bunch of students there, super nice, um, totally welcoming. They taught me whatever I wanted to know. And um, I know there's like a whole series of books and in instructions called S Stitch and Bitch, but that does not reflect the personality of the knitters and crocheters that I have met. Um, so that's how I got into knitting. Uh, I also have a little link there for some projects that I've done. And just to show you how qualified I am for this. <laughs> um, and it opened in my other tab, so hold on a sec. So this is like a yoga bag, a hat, a scarf. I made a little stuffed caterpillar, a cow, um, and then what's that, a hat. Um, and this is my profile on a website called Ravelry, which is like a, almost like GitHub for knitting and crocheting. Um, so that'll come up again in this presentation. And I also have here live examples of a scarf that I made and wear a lot. It's really long. I'm like, well, maybe I should have made it shorter. And um, so that, this is real quick, sorry. This is knit, this is called basket weave knitting, this pattern. Um, yeah, go look in the camera to make sure you can see it. And then uh, this, is crocheted. So this is a hot uh, hot pad slash hot holder. And I made this also, you know how a lot of times you stack your pants inside one another, but you don't want them to get scratched. So I use this inside each of the pans too. So it has more than one use. And basically I made like a swirl and I made two layers and um, stitched them together at the edge. So it's nice and thick. So two examples there. All right, so we're gonna get crafty here. This is what we're gonna talk about today. Knitting versus crochet. What's the difference? The basics of both. Um, knit and crochet 101, just what, the very basics of each are. So code and spies and knitting. And then at the end, we're gonna do a craft along. Um, I figured I wasn't gonna have enough time to really go into teaching everybody stuff during the presentation. So that's kind of gonna be an after thing if you wanna stay after, but um, at the end of the presentation itself, you should be able to walk away with what supplies you need and what you need to know to like start knitting or crocheting. And you'll have the resources to take with you. Um, and you know where to find me. If uh, you have any questions or anything, I'd be happy to jump into co-working and just take a little uh, programming break with you. So. Oh, and by the way, if anyone has questions or anything, feel free to interrupt. I have the chat up on the side, so um, I'll try to keep an eye on that too. All right, we have knit and we have crochet. So the I have put the definitions here um, and the basic differences are like knit is using two needles and it's interlacing yarn in connected loops and crochet is one hook and it's looping stitches through um, to create it's pulling it's pulling the thread through loops to create stitches um so let's see here's the basics of string theory we have I broke it down 
to four groups. I think that's really what it comes down to. We have tools, our yarn stash, patterns, and patience. Um, once you get into it, you will become familiar with the yarn stash. I, I've been following Amy's journey and um, it seems like she's caught on quite quickly about the whole yarn stash. You just start collecting it and you're like, I can't make things fast enough to get rid of all this yarn. So uh, yeah, tools. So hooks are for crocheting and needles are for knitting. Both crochet hooks and knitting needles can be made out of um, plastic, aluminum, wood, or bamboo, but I prefer the aluminum, which these are both out of aluminum. Um, I have over here plastic. So this is a set of crochet hooks. Um, a lot of times they're sold in sets of like four or five or six. And the reason I prefer that is because the plastic um, tends to become brittle. So you see how much thinner this is. They have sets that are that size as well. These just happen to be bigger. And when you're moving like that, after a while it becomes brittle and I've had hooks snap on me before. And I've had bamboo um, knitting needles, but my little monster uh, Pip has uh, chewed on them. So I come back and like the point at the ends all chewed up. So I'm just like, okay, well, can't use this anymore. Um, so the crochet hook has the notch at the end and that's what draws the string through the loop. And you may see uh, crochet hooks made out of steel. So these ones are teeny tiny. They're even smaller than this. They're used for lace weight yarns and threads and they're for making like doilies and ornaments and stuff like that. Like very delicate things. So that's like a whole different sizing and that's not what we're talking about today. Um, as for knitting, the straight needles, which I've been holding up, they're the most commonly used type. So you'll see them with a point at the end and a knob at the other end. And this prevents stitches from coming off. And this usually has, um, the label size on it too. So I don't know if my camera, yeah, I don't think it can focus actually, but you might be able to see it has the size on it. Um, and, oh, okay. And then there's other types of knitting needles, um, double pointed and circular needles. So hold on just a second. So double pointed needles, I have these all in a bunch. Um, yeah, I'll take them out. Yeah. Okay, double pointed needles. So this is in a pack of five. Um, they have on both ends and they're usually used for things like uh, knit, it's called knitting in the round. So like socks and mittens and things like that. Um, and then <laughs> uh, circular needles, they have, um, so they have two points at the end, but then they have like a, string like a flexible string between them and the, these will be used for bigger things like sweaters or afghans um things like that so you can really bunch up the work 
in here. And also I mentioned sizing before. Uh, so this, these needles are size nine. I have size 35 knitting needles here. So these are like a really chunky yarn. If you wanna make like a big blanket or a ridiculous scarf. Um, yeah, these are kind of novelty, I guess, but I don't even know where I got them from, to be honest, but uh, yeah, it's just fun to show off. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go. Yeah. And okay, let me get some more tools. So we have our knitting and stitch gauge. Um, this helps you check the gauge of your hooks and needles as well as your work. And this is my favorite one is called Susan Bates Knit Check. Um, this is super handy because it's like you know, giant acupuncture. It's like um, it's super transportable. So basically what it does is you take your needle. So these ones, they don't have anywhere for to mark the size. So you like put it in the holes until you see which one it fits through. So it's like, okay, this is the one. So this is also, this is a size nine needle. And with these, you'll notice these are both the same color. A lot, a lot of times they color code on like the brands will color code the sizing. Also, the there's a little ruler here. So a lot of times what you do is you knit out a swatch using the needle size and you make sure that the gauge is correct, which means um, for the number of stitches, it's supposed to be X amount of inches. So you use this to measure that. Uh, yarn needles. So th these are like big blunted sewing needles and you use them to take what's on the end. Um, so actually I'll show, I'll show you. So like for the gauge, I have a little swatch right here that I did. For the gauge, you basically put it down on the ground and or on the table and kind of measure up to see how big it is. Um, once you do the proper amount of stitches. For yarn needles, this one's plastic. They have them in metal too, but you can see it's a lot thicker and bigger than a regular needle. And I can like do that. You would use it to sew in this end and you just sew it right into like the hem or the seam here. Um, oh, there's stitch holder. So stitch holder is used like if you're working on something and you get tired of it because like knitting a blanket takes a really long time. Uh, <laughs> so you want to take a break but you want to use the needles that you're using for the blanket. So this is a stitch holder and I know it's like kind of small so it's hard to see uh it it kind of locks in here and i have this is macrame actually that i'm working on so i have this on a needle just to hold it but let's say i wanted to use this needle for something i would just take and slip these stitches off onto the stitch holder and then lock it and now they're not they're not going anywhere and i can use this for anything also these are size 13 needles by the way and for some reason this is like my favorite pair of knitting needles i just thought i'd show them off they're my babes <laughs> uh 
Okay, stitch markers. So, um, these are stitch markers. So they, these ones are locking stitch markers. They can help you mark your place in your work. So a lot, they're used for a lot of different things. Some people use them to mark when they need to increase or decrease the work. Um, or if like they're going to change the stitch that they're gonna do. Um, some people, there's all different kinds. Um, if you Google it, you will see. Uh, so some of them are completely enclosed like rings or various other shapes and some are locking. So these are locking stitch markers. Um, they're open and you can just go and lock them shut like that. And um, here's a, a tip from your friendly Neg. If you don't have stitch markers, just use a paper clip. That's what I would do all the time. Like if I can't find any on hand, I just use a paper clip and slip it in there. Somehow I found a nail with my paper clips. I don't know how that got in there, but. Um, and lastly, uh, yeah, everything's a stitch marker if you try hard enough. Thank you for your color commentary, Abby, because I know you have experience with this. Um, and lastly, pen, pen or pencil, scrap paper, and scissors. I almost always throw a pen in whatever bag I have my knitting stuff in. And I just find it helpful when you're going through a pattern to just make a little check on something like for every 10 stitches you do or something like that to um, remember what you did so you don't lose count, right? And I have a teeny tiny pair of scissors too that I carry around, but there's been so many times where I have forgot them. So um, I keep, nail clippers in my purse, just, you know, for my nails, those work just fine too. They cut right through the thread. Also, this isn't on my list, but I want to show you because it's pretty cool. Um, I have this little uh, ceramic decorative pot thing and inside there's a yarn ball. It's like got this cut out here meant to hold a yarn ball and have the string hang out so you can pull and the ball won't roll around. Um, I think I found it at a craft show and uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. I'm gonna cruise through the... Okay, it looks like questions are being answered by other people. Um, so I'll just let that happen. Yarn, yay! Uh, <laughs> yarn sources, there's a lot of them. Um, usually they come from animals, plants, or they're man-made. So wool mainly comes from sheep, but also there's other types of animals. Uh, yeah, ababa. No, Abby, keep answering because it's, you guys got it. You guys got it because I got a lot of slides. <laughs> um, so yeah, cashmere, it's like one of the softest wools. It's actually six, time fi six times finer than human hair. And it comes from cashmere goats. They shed their undercoat only one time a year so um, it's not 
they don't shear the goats, they comb it out and then it's collected. So when it takes four goats to make a sweater, like that makes the yarn super expensive. Um, alpaca wool is from the South American alpaca and the two types are Wayaka and Surrey. Um, this wool is like super warm, but if you run it through the wash, it'll felt. So that means like, instead of looking all nice and pretty like this, it just turns into felt. So it, yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, merino wool comes from the merino sheep and its advantages are it's hypoallergenic. Um, and mohair is from the Angora goat, not the rabbit. Uh, the Angora rabbit makes Angora wool. Um, so lastly, silk yarn comes from the cocoon of silk worms, but it's better used in blends because silk is like really slippery. It'll slip right off an aluminum needle and it, doesn't have like any stretch. Um, so cotton yarn, it's largely produced in the US, China and India. And hemp, hemp is the new kid on the scene. Uh, <laughs> it looks a lot like twine, but um, appearances are deceiving because it's still really soft. Uh, bamboo yarn is actually like when the bamboos turn into yarn is softer than silk and it has na natural antibacterial properties to it as well. And then uh, the acrylic yarn is a man-made synthetic fiber. So it's the cheapest one out of all of these. And it's really good for beginners It because it's cheap. Um, it holds up well in the wash but it'll melt if you iron it. So don't do that. Um, then there's specialty yarns. I'll show you some of those, but it's just like adding a little bit of pizzazz and whatnot. And then blends. So these are blends of different types of yarns. A lot of times it's acrylic blended with other things like wool or cotton. And that's just to like make the yarn hold up better in the wash and just work better. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple different types. My mom just got here. She's gonna be the official pip wrangler now. Yeah, she's upstairs. So this, This is 100% acrylic yarn. And this is what's called a skein of yarn. This is like a normal size. Um, you can see there's like two strings here. This one's the outer string and it, it's what wraps around it. And then there's usually one that comes out of the middle. And if you pull from the middle string when you're working, that's like the neatest way to do it because then you don't have to like keep unro unrolling from the outside. It starts to get a pain. Here it just unravels from the inside all nicely. Pro tip. Um, <laughs> this is bamboo yarn. So you can see it's finer and it's softer. You can't feel it, but trust me. <laughs> Oh, I like this. She likes it. <laughs> um, here is a, I don't know if this is specialty yarn. It seems kind of like it is. It's like more uh, fleecy and it's definitely chunky. 
Like I would use a bigger needle with this or bigger crochet hook. This is definitely a specialty yarn. It's glittery. It, um, this is what one strand looks like. So as a beginner, I wouldn't work with this just because it's difficult to see. Um, something like this, actually, if you wanna work with it, it would be nice to put two threads of yarn together like this with an acrylic, because then you get kind of like a glitter accent. Um, there's also this specialty yarn. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, let me see. This has like a felt on this one side and it's lace throughout. So you can knit like this or knit into the lace. And I'll show you with this other one here. Maybe we'll see it better. So this is one without the felt on it. Um, now these scarves are pretty cool once you get the hang of it. What it's meant to do is stretch out like this and you knit into one side of the lace. So when you're done, it looks all ruffly. Um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so on the suggestion list that I uh, sent out, this is one of the things, the Karen cake. This is a big pie. This is like if you're having a birthday, not like a little cup cake, um, but this is a like variegated type yarn and this will stripe. So you see this blanket on the side, how it's making these stripes. It'll just do that automatically because of the way the yarn is dyed, which is quite clever. And then you get stuff like this. I was given this. I have no idea where you can get it from, but it's a big old spool of yarn. So there you go. Jeez. Um, okay, so also here's the different, here's a chart. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but in the resources, I highlighted um, different weights. You can see along the top that um, there's those icons. So where is it? This, this sock yarn, this is a number one, the super fine. And you see underneath, it says type of yarns and category sock. This, this is a number six, super bulky. So yeah, super bulky roving. Don't know what that means, but just to give you an example of what those look like. All right, patterns. There wasn't much to say about this. So I just kind of put down um, resources where you can find patterns. Ravelry is definitely my go-to. Um, Yarnspirations I really like as well. And, oh, uh, where's that one? So I just took off the wrapper off the sock thing. Almost every wrapper, nope, not that one. Okay. Almost every wrapper has a pattern. 
on the inside. So the ruffly one I showed you, you open up the wrapper and there's a pattern right on the inside. So it's kind of like a little kit that you get. Okay, lastly, patience. Um, it's okay, you're gonna mess up, that's fine. Cause you can fix it. Uh, and I will show you how. Oh, Jesus. That seems okay, you know how I said I got that big spool as a gift? I also got a half crocheted, not even half crocheted blanket with it. <laughs> um, yeah, the lady's like, yeah, I'm done with this. I don't want it. <laughs> so, I'm going to show you on this. <laughs> There's two ways to fix a mistake. One is called frogging. I'm not sure how that name came about, but here's a demo. <laughs> you just rip it, just rip it off. I'm gonna have to do this with this whole thing, you guys, eventually. Just keep ripping it off right until you get back to the part that you get messed up at, right? And it's like, okay, my mistake's right here. So, all right, cool. Back to my mistake. And now I can keep going. But look at this. It looks like ramen noodles, right? <laughs> what am I going to do with it? Oh my God, it's everywhere. Well, with acrylic, with acrylic yarn or cotton yarn, you can soak this in cold water. I think it's only like 15 or 20 minutes. And then, um, It'll like soak it up and this will like come back and expand out and then just hang it up to dry, air dry, and it'll be fine. It'll unramen itself. The other way is called tinking. <laughs> My mother has a question. So like you would have to cut that off and then how do you keep going from there. Well, I don't have to cut it off. She's saying I would have to cut it off and how do I keep going? I thought you were saying that because you were saying, what do I do with it? I could oh. soak it attached, still attached oh, to the blanket. Okay. Or I could cut it off and then just tie, I could just tie on okay. um, the end of that big spool and keep going. Because as we saw earlier, I have my yarn needle and I can knit in those loose ends with my yarn needle when I'm done. Great question. Um, so tinking, uh, tink is knit spelled backwards. So that's more handy with knitting. This is crocheted. So I can't really show you with this, but that is just carefully going back stitch by stitch and undoing it until you get to the spot. And a lot of times if you notice that you make a mistake, um, then you can put a stitch marker in where it is to hold that place. So for both of these instances, so you don't go back too far and then you're like, oh my gosh, now I messed it up even more. Um, so that's a really handy thing to do as well. Okay, those were the four basics. Um, now knitting 101. So what we're using today with the examples 
pen or pencil, paper, knitting needles, and yarn. I think I'm always going to say yarn. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think. I'm just deciding what to use here. Yeah, I'm gonna use this. I want to see what colors I can use to stand out. Okay, so oh, okay. There's gonna put this in my little pot so it doesn't roll off. So there's the basic stitches of knitting are passed on, bind off, knit, curl, increase and decrease, slip stitch, and yarn over. I'm going to show, what time is it? I'm gonna come back to this because we're gonna have the demo later. Um, but there are links for casting on and binding off because there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, knitting and purling. So when you knit, it makes like a little V shaped stitch. And when you purl, it makes like a little bump, like a horizontal bump. So this is a sample of stockinette stitch. That means I knit one row and then I purl the next. And then I knit one row and I purl the next row. Uh, garter stitch would be knitting all the way through. And I don't have a sample of that. I didn't have time. Um, but there's all different kinds of stitches and basically it's combining knit and purl to make different patterns. Crocheting, it's basically the same tools except crochet hook instead of knitting needles. The basic stitches of that is slip knot, magic ring. There's the chain, slip stitch, single crochet, double crochet, and increase and decrease. There's a, tr a treble crochet too, um, but if you know how to do a double, then you can do a triple one. Um, okay, so this is part of the Cody part that I want to make sure we got to. Um, so the fabric of code. Like I said, the knit is a V shape and the pearl is a horizontal bump. So you can relate that to knit being a zero and a pearl being a one. And people did actually. Um, in World War I and World War II, and the French Revolution, women would knit scarves and sweaters and knit patterns into these items using different codes. And like they may knit Morse code in ah. using the knits and pearls. It's the perfect cover for spy. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and this is called steganography. So that's the art of hiding messages in plain sight. Um, so for instance, and in, here's some articles that I found that are talked about it more. In World War I, uh, Belgian intelligent agents made friends with elderly women who lived near railway stations and 
the women that had windows in their homes that overlooked the train tracks, they asked them to monitor passing imperial um, German train movements. So they were just like these little ladies sitting around and knitting, you know, totally inconspicuous. And they followed a system. So throughout the day as they knit, they'd curl a stitch when they saw an artillery train and they'd drop a stitch if a troop rail car passed. So it would leave a hole in the pattern. And they'd send that along to the Belgian soldiers. And um, like something that was a big, a big effort in the war was like knit socks for our boys, knit vests, you know, to send to them. So it played right into, they were like, oh, okay. You know, they could just send it through and no one would, unless you really knew knitting patterns, they wouldn't be any the wiser. But then in World War II, um, they started to catch on so much that the US and the UK banned the printing and posting of written knitting patterns because they saw that it could be ciphered into code. Um, but they couldn't ban people from knitting. So it still happened. Uh, and then one more story that was really cool. Uh, on May 1st, 1944, a British spy named Phyllis Latour Doyle parachuted into Normandy. She was a highly trained agent taking part in a clandestine special operations executive plan to develop resistance against Nazi forces that were occupying France. She roamed the countryside pretending to be a teenager, always helpful and talkative with German troops. She managed to gather many bits of information, ultimately sending 135 coded messages before the allies finally liberated the country. Um, there's more about that story, but she uh, had over 2000 different ciphers that she carried with her and hid in ribbons in her hair and She's just like, oh yeah, no one, no one was ever on to me the whole time. Um, so yeah, it was really cool. And you can still do that today. Uh, the last link in here teaches you how um, using a grid system. So if you want to write like a little message and give some something to your friend and be like, yeah, see if you could figure it out. Drive them crazy. <laughs> um, all right, so let's make stuff. This is the fun part. This should look familiar. Um, supply list. I have, so I picked out four projects that basically my thought was by the end of today, you will know enough to be able to make these things on your own. Um, so we're not gonna bang out these projects right here, right now, but um, we're gonna learn the stitches of how to do it. Sound good? Yeah. <laughs> My mom's in, are you? <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, well, before we get into that, is there any questions?
Hey, Meg. Hi. I, I have a question. And uh, yeah, I'd also encourage anyone in the chat who has any questions um, that haven't been addressed or they want one more context to just like pop them in there. Uh, shout out again to uh, Abby and Rebecca and all the people who've been helping answer questions. I have, a, I have a weird question. I don't know if this is a thing. Do people ever do like tandem knitting? Because when you were describing the big projects like blankets and stuff, I'm like I I don't want to do that by myself. But like, do people do stuff together? Is that is that something that happens? Yeah, no, that's a good question, Kirk. Um. So a lot of times with blankets, you can knit squares and then um, use our, our handy yarn needle <laughs> or even a crochet hook to um, sew them together. So a lot of times groups will work on blankets, especially for charity cases and things like that, um, or not charity cases, but like, uh, charity fundraisers, um, they'll work on squares and then put them all together and someone will sew them all up. So yeah, it can definitely be a group effort. Neat. I just, I just don't want to make like a bedspread by myself or like a, oh, you know, like a duvet cover, like a full, you know. So I Kirk, if you love me, you make a good size duvet. I'm like, ah, no. Yeah. Can I give you a really neat handkerchief? There's um, actually, um, I know there's patterns too, like you could do hexagons, bees. Yeah. You can do hexagons and put them all together. Um, that's cool too. So I, any shape you desire. About circles. <laughs> I don't think that works. Oh, there's another thing. Um, and I couldn't find my darn picture to put up here. But when I was in knitting club, we did this cool project. Uh, some of you may have heard it. It's it's called yarn bombing, and you knit and crochet things and. It's like graffiti with yarn. So you make things and then you put them in public spa spaces on display. And it's just something really unexpected. So people are like, whoa, okay. Um, so there's a picture of me because I crocheted this really huge spider web. It was Halloween and we made spooky decorations. Someone made a spider and I crocheted a huge spider web and laid it out on the floor and I was like laying in it like I was stuck. And one of our members, he climbed up into a tree and hung it from the tree in like, I think it was Founder's Circle or something. And we hung spiders and little crocheted ghosts and things from the tree uh, for on campus. And those are the pictures I want to find. And if I find them, I'll put them up in the BC events channel. But, um, Drake, crocheting, I find to be much easier. I learned to knit first and I'm glad I did because if I had started with crocheting, I would have been like, why would I knit it? This is so hard. Uh, but if you just wanna be like, ah, I don't care. I just wanna start something. Like, look at Chris, look at her go. She's just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know? Um, but yeah, you what? can make like a hat in, less than an hour with crochet, uh, it's pretty quick. I was gonna ask like, why is crocheting easier? Um, oh, okay, okay, we talked about it in the chat too. Yeah, it's, um, well, you only have like one tool with you. Uh, 
and it's on one loop. So if it falls out, it's easier to catch it. With the um, with the knitting needle, like there'll be thing, ones where I have like 50 stitches on here. And if I pick this up and the thing slips out, I'm like, oh crap. And I have to like very carefully get it through all these. And it's easier to lose count with the knitting. Um, I, I don't know, it's just, what's that? I, I think, know. I think you can make. Yeah, talking to the. So I'm, I've heard, cause I don't know how to crochet, but I heard that like, you can make a blanket a lot faster if you're crocheting. And I think, is it cause the stitching isn't as tight? Oh, that's, that's right. Crochet is looser. Cro um, so, so it's not as warm either. Oh, I forgot to show this. Um, whoops. So this is my sample crochet. So from these first three rows, this is single crochet. And these last three rows, this is double crochet. So you can kind of see there's like spacing here um, and then less here. And that's compared to the knitting. So it really does depend on what you want to do with it. Um, yeah, the size of the hook or needle to um, the, oh, good, cool, please. Yeah, so this one is 5.5 .5 millimeters and this is four millimeters and that's what I used for those. So even so that knitting looks a lot tighter than the crochet and this is 1.5 millimeters smaller. So. <laughs> I feel like the blankets made with knitting are warmer. I, I, I think so. Um, okay, so we are just at the hour. So I think what I'm going to do, Meg, is I will do our official sign off and stop the recording. I can keep the room open, open if folks want to chat for a little bit longer, for sure. Um, We're but I want to take this time after this. Pardon? We're going to do our craft along after this. Yeah, so I think we can, I can keep this up. Um, I can leave the room open, make sure we have time for that. But for, wait, do we, do you want to keep, um, keep the recording going included in um, the final? Nah, nah. Okay. Well, then I will take this opportunity to say thank you so, so much to Meg for all of this. I came in knowing absolutely none of this. That's mainly a testament to my own ignorance. But now I know quite a lot more, and that is because of you, and I really appreciated it. Uh, I love the slides. I loved how you made it approachable and sensible. And I feel like, you know, I was I was able to follow along, go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I could see how I could get into this. Um, and I really appreciated that lots of people in the chat are also uh, knitters or crocheters or both, and they were sharing tips. And it seems like a really fun community. And I think on like part of my 2022 goals, I would like to try one of these because like you said, I'm just watching Chris and she's just, you know, she's just doing it. And I'm like, that looks cool and fun and kind of kind of zen. Yeah, so I, I'd love to yeah. give it a try. And also yeah. shout out to Meg's mom. You can take it along to anywhere because Meg used to bring them places like the Phillies game. <laughs> Seriously, she brought her knitting to a Phillies game. <laughs> That's kind of the nice, you know, the kids these days with their fancy fidget spinners back in my day, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's it really is a cathartic activity. Um, at, at Temple, one of my friends, he's an ex-Marine who had 
PTSD and he crocheted and no, he knit, he didn't crochet, but he knit and he, he's like, yeah, it's, it's really cathartic. It helps me relax. So. Yeah. yeah, I think there's something, there's something definitely like the body enjoys, I think about just like working with your hands on something. I feel like um, knitting, crocheting, woodworking, and like cooking in a sense, like they all have a similar, as part of the mechanics that your brain goes, this is nice, we can do this for a while. Um, the closest I have to that right now is listening to podcasts while I fold clothes. Um, but yeah, so I just want to say again, uh, thank you for everyone who came. Um, for those of you who are watching this, uh, when we get this up on YouTube later as well, and if you want to do your own lunch and learn like this, um, in the Slack channel, we have our VC, in the Slack, we have our VC events channel and pin there, we have the registration form. We absolutely encourage anyone and everyone to fill it out and um, also share. These are just like really fun things to do on a Friday to just meet with friends and kind of learn something new and share experiences. And uh, feels like a great way to, to end the week. And with that, I will say I will see you all later.